So we discussed about the um, CLR and CTS the last time. So just to add a couple of more points that CLR interferes with the operating system and it provides the multi-threading, threads, process, file I.O. and all that support, right? So all pe people who have actually coded CLR have taken care of all that account. They will create a Windows process. Like they will, so what happens is when you start up a .NET application, it, run inside, it runs inside its own app domain. And an app domain is a logical entity. Usually what happens is that the CLR will now manage these app domains in one or multiple Windows processes. So what might happen is that multiple app domains can reside technically in one Windows process. So it is you know more lightweight. That's what happens in SQL Server and IS, which actually hosts the CLR. Okay. So let's talk about how your code actually runs. So what's happening is this is a, this is a typical C# -sharp program. You know, this is a wide main. And let's say you have console two, console dot write lines. A console, you know, you're printing stuff to the console. So what happens first time is when, so you know, an IL is written for all this. And in your particular assembly, what is also getting generated is that okay. Let's say your assembly is my assembly .dll, okay? So let's say you have called, you have compiled everything into my assembly .dll, okay? What happens is that when this assembly is compiled, it also contains information that it refers to another assembly that is ms core lib. This is the assembly that contains all these C# -sharp basic types such as system, console, integer, string, etc, etc. So it says that, you know what, I, this is the system, right? This is the system and a bunch of classes. So how, what happens is that a lot of related classes will be grouped into a namespace and multiple namespaces, one or one, multiple namespaces can be part of an assembly. Um, actually, the namespace can be spread across multiple assemblies also. So what happens is here, the DLL says that, you know what, I am using from the MS Core Lib DLL the console, the system dot console, the console class, which is inside the system namespace, and I'm using a right line method. So the first time this particular method is getting hit, what will happen is that there is no IL for this method, right? So C# doesn't know where exactly is this method, um, where does it look in, how does it look for this particular method? So what will happen is that C# will go to will know okay that it is from the MS Core Lib assembly. Since it is the MS Core Lib assembly, it knows that the MS where to look from the MS Core Lib assembly since it's, it's a deep, it's kind of a system assembly. It will go to that DLL, it will find out from the DLL where is the IL for this particular function right line. It will go to the IL, load IL and compile it for that particular host, for that particular machine. So that is what the JIT compiler does. So it's just in time compiler. So it is only when it's needed will the compilation take place. That's why it's called just in time compiler. Now once this compiler, once what happens is once for this write line function, the um, the just the JIT will compile all this contain into the host and it will keep it in its memory. Next time when the write line function gets hit it is no longer going to compile it, it is going to use it the next time. So if you think about it, the runtime, at runtime this compilation, this particular translation is taking place from IL to the machine language. So this is what the translation is taking place. So is it, so what is the performance? Is it performant enough? Well, uh, it is definitely a performance hit, right? But at the same, but what you have to understand is that my, you know, Microsoft has invested heavily in this particular aspect so that it has made the JIT faster and faster. And if you realize that the JIT now actually takes into consideration of the host machine, let's say there are two CPUs, so it will, you know, accordingly, let's say there's a particular type of processor. So while trying to output the native code, it will take into all these considerations and all those optimizations will be part of that native code. That is something, you know, that is something. So is it like Java virtual machine? It is, yes, it is. You can think of the CLR as the JVM, yes. You can think of it that way. Then why should we switch over from JVM to CLR? Well, that's a good question, right? So, 
if you think, uh, there are two diff there are two different competing technologies, right? Um, Microsoft offers a huge, so you know everything is inbuilt now, everything is inbuilt, everything has CLI support baked into the system and just the richness of libraries that Microsoft provides is huge and you, you'll see to it, right? That Depth, you know, it is coming up with new programming models like Windows Communication Foundation, the Presentation Foundation, Workflow Foundation, all this is based on CLI. That's what the support is. You know, it's just that, okay, what are you getting out of the box? And then you see that, you will see that, you know, going, so we are just talking about CLR 2.0, but with uh, C Sharp, you know, it has put up, now it has come up with advanced features of generics and link and whatnot and whatnot, right? So all this richness in the language is what you get when you use a microservice or technology. Okay. So that's, that's about it uh, for the JIT compiler. Let's talk a little bit more about some, some things that we have not covered. Right. So we sp we definitely spoke about the common type system. The common type system is nothing but uh, CLR, and what it ensures is that hey, since everything is uh, you know gets compiled into in, into IL, if there is a if you write a type or a class that is in VB, you can use it, use it from C sharp. Right. So that is something that like for example Java does not you know inter interoperability, and that is something that Java does not provide. Right. So. That's it. So can I create a type like uh, named uh, ABC in uh, uh, CTS? Yeah. yeah. You can you can create whatever, t if the type is not already existing, yes. And you know, once again, uh, we will talk about how um, you, ma you may create a type called as ABC and I, I meaning another company can, two companies can create the same type, let's say the same namespace and everything, how can they still be different? Right, so we can, we will talk about how to uniquely identify, and that's when we'll talk about signing assemblies and you know uniquely identifying assemblies. So let's talk a little bit about. So once we are done here, let's talk a little bit about deployment. Right, so we know about the problem of DL, DL hell, and the basic the basic problem is that a program is compiled with one DLL version, and another DLL version comes, and the program doesn't work anymore. Right, so how does how what so what does this deployment mean? How do we get rid of it, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So Microsoft, when it when it designed .NET, it thought about all these things. And the basic idea is that when you compile, multi, you could compile you compile a set of pro, a set of code files into a module, and you can bunch together a lot of modules and resource files. When I say resource files, it might mean like GIF files and you know text files or whatever into a particular assembly. Uh, that's how the de so your deployment might just be copying a simple assembly. That's that's basically your deployment. You don't have to you know go to a the registry and you know <laughs> deploy files throughout. No, everything is there in one particular in one or multiple assemblies. X copy deployment. Pardon? X copy. X copy deployment. Yes, you, you think about it as X copy deployment, and I think you do uh, you do use that a lot when you do it. Web programming, right? With ASP, I guess so. I don't, I'm not sure about that. Okay, so let's let's look a little bit about the metadata as to what these things, what are the uh, what are the things in, inside a particular assembly and module. You know, when it get compiles, what is that that gets generated? So it's always interesting to look into all these things, and uh, this this it's it's always a good thing, right? So let's we we'll, we are going back. We are going to a computer, right?